All right, everybody, let's get started. Um, before we begin, just a quick heads up. Um, I am uh, feeling the effects of my second shot, which I took yesterday. So, uh, so yeah, I know that, that sometimes it's a it's a crapshoot with the uh, the symptoms. Well, I I got some. Uh, <laughs> I um, uh, so so forgive me if I'm a little like I don't know slow today or, or whatnot. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll keep on trucking. Okay, um, just a heads up on some announcements. So, uh, attendance grades are up to date. Uh, like I said, we're gonna keep on trucking with the homework schedule. So 5.1 is due today. Homework 5.2 is assigned today to be due Monday. Um, and we'll keep on chucking there. I have here that the exam will most likely be returned on Monday. I'm assuming that's the case. Uh, then again, I think it depends on if I feel any more symptoms for the rest of the weekend. Um, but we'll see. I'll, I'll get it graded uh, as soon as possible because I have two sort of really big items on my desk for grading. There's that and then there's the alternatives reports from Capstone. I keep saying I was going to get them done and then it's like uh, I've been just been loaded up with other stuff. So I need to I need to produce those grades as soon as possible. Um, <coughs> excuse me. OK, so today what we're going to do is we're going to continue on our discussion of the um, the AISE specification for columns, but what we're really going to focus on is how to actually analyze a column because up until now, all we really did is talk about this. And I think it was a pretty useful discussion because um, what we did is we said, okay, let's start off with this expression on top. This is the elastic buckling stress or what's sometimes called the Euler buckling stress for a given column. And then we basically talked about why it doesn't work. Um, and besides the effective length factor K, which does need to be incorporated, the really big issues are the presence of residual stresses and the presence of geometric imperfections. And so those uh, imperfections tend to affect the elastic buckling capacity a little bit more, and the uh, uh, residual stresses tend to affect the inelastic capacity. So um, we have this term FCR. FCR is the critical buckling stress for a column that uses the FE term, uh, but it, um, so FE is not the, the answer. You know, we, FE was the result of our uh, uh, differential equation uh, derivation. Uh, FE is not the, um, the answer, but it is useful. We utilize FE in order to compute the answer. And the answer uh, depends on whether or not your slenderness, where it falls on either side of this limit, 4.71 square root of E over Fy. And there's nothing really special about that term, 4.71 square root of E over Fy. All that is is taking this term, oh, hold on, I got to turn my pen on. All that is is taking this term, setting it equal to this term, doing a bunch of substitutions, and solving for the KL over R. Putting the KL over R on one side, putting everything else on the other. And the algebra is a bit involved, uh, but once you do it, you end up getting 4.71 square root of E over Fy. So there's nothing particularly special about that, that value. That's just where the two equations equal one another. And so depending upon your slenderness, you're either in inelastic range or the elastic range. So the inelastic range is governed by this 0.658 raised to the Fy over Fe. That fraction Fy over Fe is an exponent. You don't take 0.658 times Fy over Fe. It's 0.658 raised to the Fy over Fe. And you multiply all of that times Fy. And then for the elastic range, it's just Fe reduced a bit. And that reduction is for the, you know, the imperfections. All right, any questions about that? Um, <clears throat> like I said, if you graphed it correctly, it should look, you know, something like that. And probably like maybe about right there is the point where either equation one or equation two govern. Should look something like that. Everybody good? All right, I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, the other thing I wanted to put out is the, um, the uh, values for K. Um, we really didn't use these on the homework. I was just telling you, like, here's where you can find them. We're going to use them today. So uh, just make sure that you have this handy. Remember, we use the theoretic, or we do not use the theoretical value. We use the recommended value. Um, and you can find that in the back of the code. It's actually in the commentary in the, like, the rear part of that AISC 360 section. Um, it's like right near the end of the gray pages on 16.1-570. Okay. 
let's talk about column analysis. Now, before we talk about column analysis, I want everybody to pull the camera up if you can, because I want to talk about strong axis versus weak axis, okay? And this is something that we really haven't talked about, so I've turned my camera on to where it's just me. And I want to talk about just this shape here. This is the, uh, the my sort of flex I-beam demo that I use. Uh, and it's nice because it's an eye shape. You know, it's a it's it's sort of representative of the geometry that we would see uh, when we um, when we're when we're doing these types of problems. Now, one of the things I, I, I sort of glossed over last time, but now I think we need, we need to d uh, dive into is when I press this, I apply compression. So I'm taking it, I'm squishing it. Um, it buckles like this. Okay. So, for instance, if you're looking at it this way, sort of the cross section moves left to right. Like if I take it and I buckle it, it goes left to right. It doesn't go up and down. It buckles left to right. Okay. And that's, that's if I take my hands on either end and load. Okay. There is a reason for that. Okay. There is a reason why the section buckles in that fashion. And it's about the uh, values associated with the strong and the weak axis. Um, let's talk about that. Let me bring my lecture back up. Let's talk about um, that a bit. Now, we've kind of seen this before, but it's going to become very, very important later, um, or today, and it's going to be very, very important for, uh, for some time to come. Um, the capacity of the column is a function of the radius of gyration. Now, that's not a, a particularly revelatory statement. I mean, um, when you did your homework, you were putting FCR on the y-axis, but on the x-axis, you were putting KL over R. R is the radius of gyration. And if you remember, all a radius of gyration is, is the square root of I over A. So it stands to reason you're going to have an RX and an RY. You know, the areas are the same. Uh, these are just, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the formulas in which you would use to compute those. And you can test that, just pull a random W shape from the manual, pull its um, IX and its IY and its area and see if you get the same value, and you will. Um, one of the things, though, that I want you to pay attention to is if you look at W shapes, you will find that I don't care what W shape you pull up, RX is going to be bigger every time, every, every time. And so much so that we call the x-axis the strong axis, and we call the y-axis the weak axis. Okay, um, a uh, a pretty um, hands-on example of this would be to imagine if you had something like a yardstick in your hand. If you have a yardstick in your hand and you take that yardstick and you press on it, it's gonna buckle about that that long side. And so if you take the yardstick in your hand and sort of like bend it about that one direction, it's kind of flimsy, but if you, you're bending it and it's kind of flimsy, take it and turn it 90 degrees. And about that other axis, it's very, very stiff. The reason why is because the moment of inertia is much higher about the strong axis than it is about the weak axis. All the radius of gyration is, is just a different way of expressing that moment of inertia. Okay. So, um, if we look at, you know, W shapes, you know, the RX is, is always going to be bigger. Now, that, that isn't always the case for shapes like angles and WT. Sometimes with WTs, it's flipped because you're, you know, cutting the section in half. And sometimes with angles, um, if it doesn't possess symmetry, there's, there's a, a listing for a Z axis. That's the worst case scenario. And I think we've already seen a lot of this uh, when we did slenderness checks for tension members. Okay. Um, so everybody with me so far? Any questions? Okay. All right. Now let's let's see how this shakes out in the in the real world. Let's talk about the example that um, that I'm that I'm referencing right here. So I've got a column, and let let's put some numbers to this. Okay. So let's say we have a W shaped column. It's pinned on both ends. So if it's pinned on both ends, first off, that means the K value equals one. Uh, and it doesn't, and for, for the sake of our example, we're going to assume that K equals 1 about both directions, like about the x-axis and the y-axis. It won't really matter. And that'll, you'll see what I mean here in a second a, a little more clearly. Now, uh, let's say the column is 20 foot long, okay? So let's take, for instance, the x-axis. Okay, so we have the K is 1. We have the length 
is 20 feet and the RX is listed here, and I just made up some values here, 6.20 inches. So somebody help me out in the chat. What is KL over R for the x-axis? Excuse me. All right. First mistake. Let me show you something. Feet. Inches. That was a little bit of a, a mean thing to do, but you always have to convert the length into inches. Sl uh, slenderness is unitless, okay? So I, I had a feeling somebody would say 3.23 because they take 20 over 6, but you have to take that 20 and multiply it by 12. So now what is the KL over R? There we go. Okay. So 38.7. Um, and let's leave it like to that level of specificity. Keep in mind that the R is 6.2 inches. It's not uh, 6. I think if it was 6, it'd be, it, it would be actually, it would equal 40. No, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Now let's do the Y axis. I wanted the values to have a little bit of decimals to it. Um, and you'll, you'll understand why. So let's talk about the y-axis. So K is 1, L is 20 feet, but R, oh, sorry, here I am, I'm doing X's. Four point one. What are we getting for KL over R? Fifty eight point five. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the benefits, and so those values look, look correct to me. Now, one of the benefits of the homework that we did last time is everybody should have a general idea of what the curve looks like, okay? So here's the KL over R on the x-axis. Here's F critical on the y-axis. So to be clear, let's talk about the physics. Let's just not apply random symbols to this. This is the slenderness. And this is the capacity. Okay, so when you plot this, it should look something like that. So help me out uh, with the following statement. As the slenderness increases, what happens to the capacity? It goes down. Exactly right. So if I was an engineer, which value would I use if I'm trying to determine the capacity of this column? Would I use 38.7 or would I use 58.5? Making sure everybody's paying attention on this one. There, there. Well, now hold on. Uh, you got an arrow. I don't know what that means. Because there's two values up there. You got two values here. You got that. You got that. No, no, the opposite. The KL over R is the slenderness, okay? KL over R is the slenderness, okay? The higher the KL over R, that means the more slender it is. That's the, the KL over R value is a measure, if you want a better 
uh, I think a more visceral term, KL over R is a measure of a column's flimsiness, all right? The capacity goes down as KL over R increases, okay? So what we want is to, when we're, when we're looking at column analysis, we want to find the worst case scenario for slenderness in order to determine capacity, and that's going to be the highest KL over R. Does that make sense? This, this is kind of important. Okay, all right, good, good. Okay, any questions? All right, let's, let's now continue, okay? And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, now, now just to be clear, make sure everybody's clear on the, the physics of it. I mean, um, if you look at my webcam, here's the same column. Let's say this column is 20 foot long. If I take this column and I just load it like this, so the column has the same length about both directions, it has an RX and an RY, the RX is bigger, and I'm just holding it like this. So both sides, I'm preventing from translation, but I'm allowing them to rotate. And if I press it, it has a larger slenderness about the Y direction, so when I buckle it, it buckles about the Y direction, okay? About that weak axis, okay? About that weak axis. Does that make sense? Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this problem a little trickier, okay? And I'm going to throw some, some kinks into the, uh, into the situation. Let's talk about this, okay? Now, this column's a little different, okay? Now, this column uh, has um, some bracing on it, but notice how the bracing is only on one side. So, in other words, like, if, if here's the column, I've got braces over here, but no braces like this way. Like I've got one right here, but there's nothing right there, nothing right there, nothing right there, nothing right there, okay? Now first off, from a, from a physics standpoint, does it make sense that if I'm gonna put the braces somewhere, I'm gonna put them about the weak axis? Well, yeah, if I'm gonna brace something, I'm gonna brace it about its weaker direction, not its stronger direction. That wouldn't make any sense, okay? So obviously, if I'm gonna install braces, I've got um, I'm, I'm gonna install them along that weak axis. But now I got a little bit of a situation and a question that's worth asking: Would the strong axis ever govern? You know, if I go back to this problem, I had a KL over R in the x direction of 38.7 and a KL over R in the y direction of 58.5. Obviously, the weak axis governs. The question is: Would the strong axis ever govern? And the short answer is absolutely. Yes, it could, because I don't really care about the bigger R values. I care about the biggest KL over R values. I don't really care about the individual R values very much. I want to find the worst case slenderness value. See, if I look at this from an analysis perspective, I see a column that's ab about the x-axis, about the strong axis, is 35 feet long. But about the weak axis, I have three unbraced segments. One of them is 10 foot long, one of them is 15 foot long, and the other is 10 foot long. Okay, And each of them have not only different lengths, but they also probably have different K values. Okay, So what that means is that it's possible for a column to have um, a, 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 you know, a larger KL over R about the X axis than it is about the Y axis. If you don't believe me, let's look at this. So this is the same example we just looked at. It's a 20 foot long column. It's the same R values. It's the same uh, RX and RY, the same K values. The only thing I did differently is this. I added a brace on that Y axis, right? The Y axis was weaker, so I said, let's put a brace on there. So let's, let's take a look at this. So now let, let's see what, we, what we've got going on here. So for the X axis, I've got K is um, one, I've got L is 20 feet, and I've got RX is 6.20 inches. And so KL over R, I believe that we computed that to be 38.7. But for the Y axis, okay, so this has a K of one, this has a K of one, because everything's pen pen, and that could change, and we're gonna have a problem here in a second where that does change. Now the lengths are different. Now this is 10 feet. 
LY is 10 feet. Now RY is 4.1 inches. 4.1 inches. So right off the bat, both of these segments are going to have the same KL over R because they have the same K and they have the same length. What is KL over R for that segment? And I'll put an X up here for this one. X. Twenty nine point three. So now we've got two situations. Now, first off, our governing value is going to be the largest. Before it was fifty eight point five. Now it's thirty eight point seven. So if we think about this just from a practical standpoint, well, if I'm going to put a brace on there, it better have an impact. And it did because it dropped the slenderness for that column. If it dropped the slenderness for that column, that means the capacity goes up. And if the capacity of that column goes up, maybe I can use a smaller column to resist whatever loads on it. Okay, um, But it also meant that by putting that brace, now we have the x-axis governing, not the y-axis. Okay, Does that make sense? That's, that's a really important concept. And I've been, I've been doing this for a while, and that's probably the, um, the, the key concept that, that folks tend to have uh, an issue with. And so I want to make sure that's clear. If you understand this idea, you understand columns. The rest is just grunt work. Like grunting through the, the calculations, the, um, the, you know, some interpolation. It's not hard. If you understand this, you're good. I want to give everybody a sec, see if they have any questions. Everybody good? All right. Let's talk about how to analyze columns. And um, what I want to uh, go through is the fact that there are actually two methods. Now, right off the bat, that's actually a little untrue because there's there's actually three. But the third method is um, really, in my opinion, just a way of you checking your, your math. And if you have two values, two methods that check your math, I don't, I don't really see the value for the third one. It can make some of the math go a little quicker, but then you have to keep more in your head. It's like, let's just keep it simple. So we're going to do two methods. One of them is the analysis of the uh, uh, columns using the equations, and the other is using a design aid. So let's start off with just sort of laying that out. Um, we have two different methods that we can use for analysis. Um, uh, one is a design aid and one is just the raw equations. The first point I want to make is that they both yield the same answer. It's not about um, you know using a different method, you get a different capacity. No, it's, it's the same answer. Um, but there, there are two reasons why you want two methods. One, um, the two methods serve as a check for one another. So if you do the analysis using method one and do the analysis using method two, you should get the same answer. Plus or minus some, some rounding associated with like interpolation and whatnot. Um, the other thing is that in order to design a column, you pretty much can't design a column without um, table 41A, and that'll become clearer uh, here in a bit. Now, um, the method for analyzing a column using the equations is pretty straightforward. I think you could probably piece it together right now because there's really not a whole lot to it. The capacity of a column is 0.9 times F critical times AG. And so if you have a column, you know 0.9 and you know AG, you can look AG up for a column. The only thing that you need is F critical. But that was kind of the point of the homework on Wednesday is so that you would be familiar with these equations so that when you start pulling them out, you're not going, wait, where, where is this value coming from? Now you have some experience with them. The, the first step is to determine the KL over R for the column. And, and ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to look at the x-axis, look at the y-axis, find the absolute highest KL over R that you can, and that's what you're going to use. You're going to use that KL over R to compute FE, then compute F critical, then compute um, 0.9 F critical times AG, and boom, that's the capacity. That's all there is to it. Um, what I want to do is I want to do an example on that. I want us to do one right now. Um, we're going to do uh, the following column. And this column is the same column I had in those pictures uh, a while back. 
Now, we're going to have different K values for different segments. So there's going to be like different KL over R's across the board. We should honestly just sort of look at all of them um, and just find the worst case scenario. The other thing that's worth mentioning, uh, and, and I haven't really talked about this, and so I kind of want to illustrate it. Um, I mentioned in class last time that we were going to stick with W shapes. We are also going to stick with W shapes and 50 KSI for our yield stress for the rest of the semester. Um, there is a reason why. Um, the long story short on that is a lot of the design aids that we use um, are restricted to that material because 50 KSI steel is the most common material grade for a W shape. And a W shape is the most common shape to use for a column and a beam. So that's why we're restricting that. Doesn't make the process harder uh, if you use a different grade. You just kind of need more uh, uh, guides. Now, one thing that is worth mentioning is that if you do a, um, a column, for instance, that's not a W shape, what if it's an angle or what if it's a, um, a T shape or an HSS? Some of the equations that we've been using aren't going to work or are going to need to be tweaked. So I want that said very clearly that if you're using um, different expressions that you're going to have, or different shapes, that you're probably going to have to use different equations. Um, most of the theory is very similar. What can tend to happen um, is uh, if you have a section that doesn't have symmetry or, or a different type of symmetry, I should say, um, you can introduce torsion, so sometimes when you load the column, not only does it want to buckle, but it wants to twist. Um, sometimes you can have local buckling effects, which I'll talk about that near the end of our, our discussion on columns. Uh, and so it's not harder, it's just there's a little bit more that you've got to go through. Um, any questions before we jump right into this? And again, my apologies if I'm like a little slow or if I'm repeating myself. Just uh, I'm just wondering if any of the any of you all got the license plate on that truck that hit me, because <laughs> uh, whoo, that is uh, those the, that second shot, man. It it had some symptoms. Okay. Um, all right. Can everybody see the um, the screen here? Everybody see this? Excuse me. Okay, so where's my mouse pointer? Sorry. Okay, so this is the same column that we looked at. And one of the things I went ahead and did, just because I want to make the column uh, analysis example go a bit smoother, is I went ahead and looked up all the section properties. So that for this problem is just the gross area and then the radii of gyration. Now, technically what you're supposed to do is check local buckling as well, but we're gonna look at that at the very, very end. It's not very hard, but I don't wanna go down too many rabbit holes with details. I just wanna take it one step at a time. So we'll do, we'll talk about local buckling uh, a bit later. Uh, the yield stress is 50 KSI for A992 steel, so you have all of that. So I'll give you a sec to, uh, to uh, write that stuff down. Okay. All right, so um, while you all are copying this down, let's see if we can um, go through and determine which is the worst KL over R. So let's start off with worst case KL over R. Now, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to set this up as a little table. Now, help me out. How many um, segments about let's say the y-axis am I going to have to consider? How many different segments am I going to have to compute a KL over R for for the y-axis? Three. And how many uh, uh, segments for the, um, the x-axis? One. Exactly right. So what we're going to do is we're going to say x and then we're going to say like y1, y2, y3. So we'll, we'll do something like that. And so maybe what we'll do is we'll say this is the x segment and this is y1, y2, y3. Just, just so that we're um, using the same naming. Now what you ought to do is first off you should open up the manual to the k chart. So because we're going to need k values, l values, and r values 
for each of these different segments. So let's do K, L, and R. And then K, L over R. Um, so let's start off with the R values. So I'm actually going to work on the, like, starting with the right and work my way left. So with the R values, that's pretty simple. I've got one X axis and three Y's. So 6.14, 3.7, 3.7, 3.7. Now um, let's do the lengths, okay? Now for the X axis, that's 35 feet. But remember, everything has to be in consistent units. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a point of doing that now. I'm not sure that you necessarily have to, but I wanna make a point to indicate that that's 420 inches, okay? Um, because we want KL over R, we want this to be in inches, we want this to be in inches, so the KL over R is unitless, okay? So um, for the y-axis, we've got 10 feet, 15 feet, 10 feet. And so I can do that one because that's pretty easy. 10 times 12 is 120. That's the same thing here. And 15 times 12 is 180, I believe. Yeah. Ooh, that is a headache. Okay. Um, everybody with me so far? Any questions? Now, help me out. Let's start off with the x-axis. What I need is a k value, okay? Now, let's look at this x-axis case just so we're clear. We have a column that has a fixed boundary condition on the bottom, and it has a pinned boundary condition on the top, okay? So, if we talk about the physics of this, a fixed boundary condition, if you remember from structures, a fixed boundary condition does not allow translation or rotation, but a pinned boundary condition allows translation. So let's see if you can identify which case this is going to be, and then what's the K value going to be as a result. So remember there are six cases, like A, B, C, D, E, and F. Let's start off with the first one. What case is that? Well, case C, keep in mind, case C allows translation, okay? But that pin support at the top, it's not going to be allowed to move. See, and the reason why is because of, of that right there. If that wasn't there, I'd probably agree with you. talking about this right here. It's B. There you go. And what is K for case B? Point 0.8. Exactly right. It's not point 0.7. Point 0.7 is the theoretical value. We use point 0.8. And I did that because that's case B. Now, before we steamroll ahead, I want to see if anybody has any questions on this because I don't want to steam through this and, and just, oh, everybody gets it. Let's stop for a second, see if everybody's clear. Everybody good? This is on 16.1-570. Is everybody is there anybody that's not able to find it? It should be in the section with gray pages. Like the, there should be gray lining on the pages. All right. Assuming everybody's good with this, let me ask you a question. On the y-axis, is there any segment that is also going to have a k value of 0.8? The bottom one, Y3, exactly. So this is 0 0.80, and that's case B. All right? Now, for the remaining cases, does anybody know what the K value is going to be? One, because they're both pinned on both ends. 
So this is one and one. Now this is case D. All right. So is everybody good with those values? That should be pretty straightforward. So what we're going to do is we're going to do it row by row. So the top row and then moving down and we're going to do KL over R. So I'm going to do the first one. So 0 0.8 times 420 divided by 6.14 and we get 54.723. And I'm going to do it to like three decimal places because I want everybody to see where the values are coming from. Honestly, you could probably do two and it'd be fine, but I, I just want like, I, I found that if you go a little bit more precise, it's it's easier for you all to see, okay, that's where he got that value. So there, there's a reason for it there. Somebody give me why one. Thirty two point four three two. Do I have a second on that? Okay, good. All right, I'm going to start calling on people because I got like a couple folks responding and I'm going to get everybody fired up. All right. Uh, Farah, what's the set uh, the third row? It must... <laughs> <laughs> oh man I will remember this alright let's try Mr. Blizzard sure <laughs> yeah I'm a, I'll call on somebody else for the last one we'll do Mr. Mitchell for the last one All right, 48.650. All right, do I have a second on that? All right, Mr. Mitchell. Twenty five point nine four six. Do I have a second on that? All right, good deal. So of these four, we're going to take which one? The big one, <laughs> right here. So, KL over R is going to be 54.723. Once you've got that, it becomes sort of rote from then on out. Um, and I'm going to do that part kind of quickly because you've got, um, therefore, you've got FE, which is pi squared E over KL over R squared. Y'all should remember that from the homework where you had to plot uh, F critical versus KL over R. So we're going to do pi squared times what? Over 54.723 squared. 29,000 KSI. Now E, I put E right there. That was cheating. All right, so pi squared times 29,000 over 54.723, and then you're going to square it. Don't forget to square the denominator. That's easy to forget.
Anybody got an answer for me? Mr. Geis. Okay, we're, we'll get Mr. Geis on the next one. So 95.578, and that's a, a stress, so that's KSI, okay? Excuse me. Now, it doesn't mean that the column can hold up uh, um, 95 KSI. That's just the elastic buckling stress. Remember, that's not the capacity. That's just a useful term to compute the capacity. So in order to compute the capacity, we have to compare KL over R, which is 54.723 to 4.71, the square root of E over FY. So that's 4.71 times the square root of 29,000 KSI over FY, and FY is going to be 50 um, for pretty much from here on out. So 4.71 times square root of 29,000 divided by 50, uh, something like 113. Yep, 113. Point four three. All right, Mr. Geis, you got the F critical one. That one's all you. So when I compare this to this, I've got KL over R is less than 4.71 square root of E over FY. So that means that inelastic buckling governs. And if inelastic buckling governs, then F critical is 0 0.658, and it's raised to the Fy over Fe. Again, that's an exponent. You're not multiplying by that fraction times Fy. And so 0 0.658 raised to the 50 divided by 95.5. We'll call it. Actually, no, I'll, I'll, I'll commit. I'll say five, seven, eight. Now, Mr. Geis, you're, it, this one's on you. And then don't forget, it's kind of easy to forget that the whole thing is multiplied by 50. And one thing you can tell if you've done this right, F critical should not be more than 50. It should be a little less. All right, 40.168. Ninety-five point five seven eight. Forty. Uh, that's what I got. Yeah, forty point one six eight ksi. Okay. One of the things I'll tell you. This is just you know, Doctor Mike's tips and tricks. More often than not, you will use this one. You won't use the point eight seven seven fe. Most of the time when we're in analysis and in design, particularly in design, when you're selecting economical columns, they tend to be in the inelastic range because you, in order to select the lightest shape, you want that shape to have a lot of stress on it. And so it tends to be in the inelastic range. So just something to keep in mind. And so now we've got um, phi pn, which is just 0 0.9. That's phi f critical and then AG. So that's 0 0.9 times 40.168 KSI. And then AG, I don't, what was AG? I'm gonna have to scroll up here, let me see. Um, 26.5, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 26.5 inches squared, and that gives us a VPN of, um, we'll leave you with a KIP value. You're, exact, you're exactly right. Like the VPN will be in KIPs because that's what you're trying to figure out is how many KIPs this section can hold up or how what's the force. Um, and so that's KIPs. All right, anybody have an answer for that? Nine fifty eight. I think it actually comes out to 958.0. Boom. All right. I'm going to mention some stuff about, because I, I, I kind of need to introduce the second method, but I'm not going to make you responsible for it for the homework due Monday. But before I do, um, does anybody have any questions about this method? I mean, 
I, I would hope to, that that this is pretty simple. It's not um, it's not particularly involved. Like all you're doing is just following the process. I think really the new stuff, the really hyper new stuff, is um, uh, this stuff over here, where you're having to determine the worst case KL over R value. Well, it is really easy. You have to do some linear interpolation. The other thing, though, that you kind of have to watch out for is you have to be careful that you're you're using the right axis. Um, let me let me sort of like pull that up just to give you kind of an idea. Um, oh, I'm way too early in the slides. Give me a sec. Um, okay, here we go. Give me a sec. Sorry, hold on, my, my sharing. Oh. Okay, so here's the problem we just did. I'm assuming everybody's good with that. Um, here's method two, and method two is to basically look up the capacity. Now, um, the thing about this table is, well, there's a couple things worth mentioning. The first thing that I think is worth mentioning is that right there. Um, table 4-1A is limited to 50 KSI steel, and that's one of the reasons why we're just limiting uh, the design here on out for 50. Now to be clear, the, ta the, the manual actually does have tables for uh, 65 and 70 KSI steel, but in no way, shape or form are they like more difficult. Um, the only reason why I limit it to 50 KSI is because that tends to avoid local buckling issues. And so I, you know, I, I, I just think that's pretty straightforward. Um, this is not only a, an analysis tool, but it's basically the way that we're going to design columns. So that's going to be what we talk about on Monday. Um, what we do in this table, though, you got to kind of be careful because um, the table lists the capacity. If you look at the very right, or sorry, the very left of it, I kind of cut it off here. If you want, you can turn to page 4-12 and follow along with me. Uh, we only have a couple minutes in class. I'm not super concerned about it. Because uh, we'll do this all on Monday, but um, the the or the table already says that the weak axis governs. Now the the problem with that is we just did an example today where the x axis governed. So can you use this table for the strong axis? And the answer is yes. What you have to do is you have to con do a little conversion. Basically, what you do is you take your strong axis KL and you divide it by the ratio of Rx over Ry. Because what you're basically doing is setting KL over R for the x-axis equal to KL over R for the y-axis and just solving. If you look at the bottom of that table, again, I kind of cut it off here, but if you look at the bottom, you'll see Rx over Ry ratios for every shape. So it's not hard. and it, There's actually less steps here. You just kind of have to, to watch what you're doing. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that you are going to be doing some linear interpolation because you're if you look at the table, let me go back here. If you look at the table, the capacities are listed based off of like a KL of 10 feet, a KL of 11 feet, a KL of 12 feet. Well, what if your KL isn't 10 feet or 11 feet? What if it's 10.6? Well, you have to interpolate between those two values. And so you got to break out your old friend linear interpolation. Um, we're going to focus on that on Monday. You have a homework assignment where I want you to just sort of repeat this process for a different column. The only thing I'll tell you before we call it for today is make sure that you're paying attention to the bracing symbols. I made it a point on your homework to follow sort of step by step the um, the the bracing symbols that are present. Um, what happened to my screen? It's sort of okay. There we go. Sorry. Um, I made it a point to use the bracing symbols that are like line for line the same things that are in the back of the manual. So just pay attention, and I sort of point you to two that look kind of close. But because they're different, it actually changes your K value. So just pay attention to that. Um, and that's that's pretty much it for today. Does anybody have any questions before we call it? All right, well, I'm hearing none. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call it. Um, I, your current assignment actually has both methods, so I'm going to tweak it so where it only does one, and then we will um, pick this up on um, uh, we'll pick this up on on Monday. Uh, that's all I got, everybody. Uh, 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 you all have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you all on Monday.